So today we're going to be starting a new sermon series, and in this series we'll be in it for, for quite some time. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at a couple books from the Bible. We're going to start by taking a look at the Gospel of Luke, uh, and then we're going to take a look at the book of Acts, which follows that up, sort of picks up. They're both authored by Luke. Luke is the author of both, his Gospel entitled Luke and, and the book of Acts, and that's Luke, who is a companion of Paul's on much of his missionary journeys, Luke the the physician, a uh, Gentile physician, follower of Christ, who, who accompanied Paul on much of his missionary journeys. He's the author of both of these books. Uh, and really, they naturally go together. You have the Gospel of Luke, and that, of course, it's a gospel, so it follows the story of Christ, uh, his life, Christ's life and, and ministry. And then the book of Acts really sort of picks up where, where the Gospel of Luke leaves off. So you have the life and ministry of Christ, and then sort of after that, now you have the life of the early church, early apostolic church, and we see that uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, and in particular, in the book of Acts, we really get sort of a summary statement. It's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That This summary statement really tells us, like, what the book of Acts is really all about. And it's Jesus speaking here, and he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And he's speaking to, to the disciples, his apostles. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. And so that's that's really what the book of Acts is all about. It's about the apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit, not sort of on their own, but in the power of the Holy Spirit going forth and proclaiming the gospel message, the truth about Christ and, and building the church and God's kingdom there in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then ultimately to the ends of the earth all across the Roman Empire. And so that's what it's about. So we get the gospel sort of story of Christ and, and his life, his ministry, and then, and then again, picking up from there, the book of Acts, where we have the early church and really the spread and expansion of, of the gospel, of the church, of God's kingdom throughout the world, throughout the Roman Empire. So for today, we're going to start, as we have this sort of two-book series that we're looking at, we're going to start at the beginning uh, with the gospel of Luke, and we're going to start at chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to go through to chapter 2, verse 20. And I know that's kind of like, that's a big chunk of, of scripture, uh, but we're going to get through all of that. We'll go through and we'll kind of march through verse by verse uh, and look at what's going on there. But I kind of, before we get there and sort of read through it all, I want to give us kind of like a, a quick summary of what is going on in these this, this passage, this sort of chapter and a half, which is probably pretty familiar to most of us. And what we see, this is sort of like in a nutshell, uh, we have the angel Gabriel appearing to Zechariah, uh, and telling him that, hey, even though you're, you're old, your, your wife, Elizabeth, she's old, she's beyond childbearing years, yet nonetheless, you're going to, to have a son. She's going to get pregnant. She will give birth to a son. This is John the Baptist, of course. Uh, so this is a message from the Lord, but, but delivered by the angel Gabriel. Uh, and then what we're going to see is not just does God say this, but then he follows through on what he said and carries it out, brings it to fruition. Uh, and then we see sort of the same thing, just sort of slightly different, but we have still the angel Gabriel, and now he goes to another person, he goes to the Virgin Mary and says, hey, even though you're a virgin, yet you're going to conceive, and not in like a natural way, you're a virgin, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And this, this child that, that, that you'll give birth to, this son, it's, it's not some ordinary person, but of course, it's God the Son in the flesh, the Messiah, Right, so this is declared, again, it's a message from the Lord, but delivered by an angel. And what does God do? He follows through on what he says. He brings it to pass. It's not like he says it and then it's like, and I changed my mind. I changed my plan. I'm not actually going to do that. No, God says it. And this is sort of the, the theme that we're going to look at here in, in this passage. What God says, he then brings to fruition, right? God is true to his word. He's faithful to his word. If he says it, if he makes a promise, if he says, I'm going to do this, it's like it's already a done deal. It's already guaranteed it will come to pass. He remains true to his word, keeps his word. Now, I understand if we sort of look at this passage, chapter one, the first part of chapter two, you might say, really, the, the central theme that, that this is all about, it's all pointing to Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all about his birth. Even the stuff about like John the Baptist, Zechariah, Elizabeth, like, and, and John the Baptist being born, that's still all building to Christ as he's the one who's sort of the forerunner and prepares the way. And, and of course, we talked all about Christ, his birth just recently with the Advent season. But I think it can be easy to sort of overlook and miss sort of this added thing that very much is present here and this idea and theme that we see in, in this passage uh, that God follows through on his word. He keeps his word. And so that's what I want us to take a look at. 
But before we even get to Luke chapter 1, verse 1, and start reading through here, I want to kind of like back up the clock a little bit and look at the Old Testament, because it's not just sort of here in Luke right before the birth of Jesus that the angel Gabriel goes to Mary and says, hey, here's what's going to happen, and then God brings it to pass. But, but rather, uh, God has been talking about this through his prophets for, for generations and generations. We're going to look at Isaiah, and here we're talking like ballpark, like 700 years before the time of Christ. And we have here God saying, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what's, gonna co- here's what's going to come to pass. And again, then what we see is, and then he does it. He doesn't say it and then fail to bring it to pass and say, yeah, I know I said that, but like, I'm not going to keep my word. I changed my plan. No, he says it even hundreds of years beforehand and then brings it to pass and does it. He follows through on his word. And so I want us to look at a couple uh, passages here in Isaiah. The first is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, certainly well-known one, especially thinking of like Advent, Christmas season that we just sort of had, a well-known one. Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And of course, this is all about Christ Jesus. The virgin, this is Mary, who will conceive, even though it's like, how does a virgin conceive? Again, it's a miracle. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. She will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Christ is the fulfillment of this. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us, God uh, the Son in the flesh with us. So again, God says it, and then as we're going to see as we read on and and look at at Luke, and I know we know this, he then does it. He doesn't just say this is what's going to happen and then fail to follow through. He says it hundreds of years beforehand, and then he goes and brings it to pass. He is true to his word. And we're going to look at Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7, another sort of good, typical, like, Advent season uh, passage here. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, which reads, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Right, sort of in a nutshell, what's being said here? Well, a, a child is going to be born. And indeed, it's, it's the Messiah. It says, right, he'll reign on David's throne. And, and who is he? Well, he's mighty God. So this is what's being said. Again, God saying it through the prophet Isaiah, but saying, this is what I'm going to do. There's going to be this messianic king who will come from the line of, of David. And who will it be? It will indeed be God himself, God the Son in the flesh. And what is he going to do? He is going to set his people free from their great oppressor and that sin. And we see that in in verse 4 when it says, For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. And here it's using imagery from from Israel's history back in the era of, of the judges when the Midianites were oppressing the Israelite people and God raised up Gideon and, and, and delivered his people, uh, working really a great miracle. It's not like it was Gideon's doing who, through his strategy, won this great battle, right? With just 300 men, God brought uh, this great victory and, and delivered his people from their oppressor. And what's being said is the Messiah is going to do that, but, but in a far greater way. The oppressor, it's not like Midian or Rome or some other nation. No, it's sin, uh, and he will set us free from that oppressor, the great oppressor, uh, sin. And he will do so, of course, by dying on a cross, paying for our sin in full. And again, the point that I want to make is here, way before Christ's time, he says it. This is what's going to happen. And then as we're going to see, it comes to fruition. He brings it to pass. It's not like, oh, he says he's going to do this and then just sort of like forgets about it, changes his mind. No, when God says it, even hundreds of years before, and it's like, it's a done deal. It's guaranteed. 
It is sure, it'll, it is solid. He will keep his word. He is true to his word. He will follow through and bring it to pass. And indeed, he does. So now I want to turn to Luke, and we'll start right at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, and just read through here, and I'll kind of interject it as we go. And as we're reading, again, have in your mind where God says something, or a messenger he sent bringing his word, like the angel Gabriel, where God says something, hey, here's what's going to happen, and then what we see is then the fulfillment of it. God says it, and then he does it and brings it to pass. So have that in your mind. I'll highlight it as we go through. Uh, but just be thinking in those terms as we read through this passage. So Luke begins, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So here, Luke's kind of giving an introduction here to his gospel, to his account of the life and ministry of of Jesus. And what does he say? He says, many have undertaken to do this same thing, to sort of uh, record much from the life and and, uh, ministry of Jesus. Uh, And certainly at, at this point, if you think of sort of typical view of like the writing of the different gospel accounts, Mark would have already been written. Probably Matthew was already written as well. So Luke could have that in his mind, like there are already other accounts out there. But he would also have in mind that, that, and certainly this was the case, that other people, not necessarily inspired scripture like Matthew and Mark and now here Luke, uh, but still nonetheless accurately recorded, you can imagine that early Christians and those who are eyewitnesses would have recorded much of the life of Jesus, even if it wasn't under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, you can imagine if you were there and you saw it, you'd sort of want to write it down. Here are some of the parables of Jesus. Here are some of the miracles he did. Here are things he's taught. And so those would have been sort of floating around in, in the early church, again, very accurately done, even if not, not inspired. Uh, and so he's saying many have, have sort of done this, some inspired, some just sort of accurate recordings of things. And, and now what he's saying is, and I've investigated all of this. Right, certainly, yes, Luke writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean that he didn't also put in the effort to like do his research and and, and investigate things. And so, right, with this in mind, he says, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So he's done his research, he's read, you know, Mark and, and probably Matthew, which was probably written beforehand, as I said, all these other accounts. But then, so he's sort of done that himself, but then, of course, as he's now penning this this gospel account, then it's done under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we know it's without error, inerrant, of course. And now I want to speak to sort of who is this most excellent Theophilus. So he's writing to a specific person here. That doesn't mean like, oh, like, why is this in the Bible? It's just for Theophilus and only Theophilus. And hey, I'm not Theophilus. You're not. He's dead. He's not here anymore. Uh, Certainly this was written for for Christians, period, end of story, like all believers, and, and certainly through the ages. But nonetheless, he does particularly identify one person, most excellent Theophilus. And I, I want to sort of speak to this first of all. Some might look at this and say, well, Theophilus means one who loves God or lover of God. So is it really like a person's name or is it sort of speaking to a believer, one who loves God? Uh, but the language of it and even most excellent Theophilus, like it, it very clearly and, and basically all scholars would say, like, no, this is a specific person that he's writing to, even though it's intended for, for everyone. That sort of, he still sort of singles out this Theophilus, who was probably his patron. Uh, and, and patronage was, was common in, in the Roman world. So if you were working, as, as Luke would have been at this time, working on some sort of uh, you know, work of writing here as he's doing. He's, he's writing it. He's collecting all this research. Remember, he talked about, like, I've investigated everything. So it's not just sort of, like, sit down, quickly write it all together. It doesn't take much time. He would have spent a lot of time investigating, looking into things. And then he sits down and, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. But so while he's working on, on this sort of this written work of his, uh, he would have had a patron who would have sort of funded it. And again, this was common. If you think of other written works, you know, sort of, famous writers in the Roman period and era, what was common is sort of, they wouldn't like make money for their written works. They would have a patron who would sort of support them, uh, fund them, provide them money for expenses, a place to live, etc. And then typically you'd then sort of like uh, give some credit to your patron or make mention of them as, as Luke does here. So that's what's going on. Theophilus is very likely his patron 
uh, and has enabled Luke to sort of devote his time. Uh, he doesn't have to like be a physician at that time, a doctor sort of like doing work to bring in income. No, he has a patron. He can just fully devote himself to this written work, to writing the gospel of Luke that we have here as his patron supports him in that. And then it's natural to sort of specifically mention that patron. You're sort of showing appreciation. And there was still a, 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 an intent in, in which, yes, this is for everyone, but I, I also want it to be in a specific way for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you specifically, Theophilus, may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So it is written to him in a special way, but again, for believers everywhere. I just want us to understand that. I know that's not like about the main point that I'm talking about, how God follows through on what he says he's going to do. But as we sort of start this, this, this book here, the Gospel of Luke, I want us to sort of understand all of that as he makes mention of it at the beginning. So now we read on verse five here. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving his priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. <coughs> then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Again, so at this point, just to highlight what, what's, what's been said, what, you know, here we have God sending this message, but, but through his, his angel here to Zechariah saying, hey, I know even though it seems impossible, your wife's beyond childbearing years, you're old, uh, yet you're gonna have a son. She will become pregnant, she will conceive uh, and you, she will give birth to a son, and you're to name him John. And then even goes on, not just sort of, hey, you're going to have a child, but a little bit more about this child, right? That he's going to be not just some ordinary guy who's of no great significance, but no, this is going to be the guy who sort of is the forerunner before the Messiah comes, who indeed is God the Son in the flesh. It's Christ Jesus. He's going to be the forerunner and sort of prepare the way. And of course, he does that again, thinking of sort of God says it, as we know, he, he does it. We're not going to get here in this passage to sort of like the ministry of John the Baptist, but he was there in the wilderness preaching, right? And telling people, calling them to, to repentance, to turn from their sinful ways, turn back to the Lord uh, in repentant faith. And, and again, preparing them for the coming of the Messiah. So again, here's what's said, this is gonna happen. And as we know, of course, it is fulfilled. And we'll even get to, to that, that fulfilling of it, God following through on what he says, on what he promises here. So reading on Zechariah, this is verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, <coughs> how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Again, even just that statement, you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time, has that idea of like, God said it's gonna happen, and so it is going to happen at its appointed time. God said it, it's gonna happen. Meanwhile, the people were, awaiting, were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. Uh, they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. 
<coughs> to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Right, so again, here we have God saying, now it's through his, his angel, the angel Gabriel, but the message from the Lord God saying, here's what's going to happen. Here's what I'm going to do. This is the word from, from the Lord. And he's saying, hey, you virgin Mary, even though you're a virgin, you're going to conceive and it's not going to be a normal conception. It's going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this child, this son who's going to be born to you, he's not some ordinary person, not even close, but rather it is indeed God the Son in the flesh, right? God the Son in the flesh, and he will be the Messiah. And again, we'll get to it as we read on, but as we know, it's not just that God says this is what's going to happen, but of course, it comes to pass. God follows through on his word. He says it, and then he does it. So we read on verse 36. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Again, here we have the angel Gabriel saying it very clearly. Again, this is, this is certainly a, a significant theme that we see in this passage, that no word from God will ever fail. He says it. He says it to Zechariah. He says it to Mary, right? Hey, for Zechariah, your wife's going to become pregnant, even though she's normally speaking too old to, to conceive, but it's going to happen. She's going to get pregnant have a child, a son, John, and here's what he's going to do and so forth. God says it, but then, right, he brings it to pass. No word of God will ever fail. And then again, to, to Mary, here's what's going to happen. Even though you're a virgin, miraculously, you're going to be with child conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, no ordinary here, here child, not just a regular person, but God the Son in the flesh, the Messiah who will come to save his people from their sin. And again, God says it, and then it comes to pass. No word from God will ever fail. It will come true. It will come to pass. Reading on verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, <coughs> where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. So again, fulfillment of what God said. God said, this is what's going to happen. You're going to become pregnant. You're going to have this son. Here we have the fulfillment. There was already the fulfillment of her conceiving, but now we have the fulfillment of him being born, God remaining true to his word, bringing to pass what he said would come to pass. So she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, 
he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. So here we have <coughs> Zechariah filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesying. So this is a message from the Lord. He's serving as a prophet and, and bringing the Lord's message to these people who, who are around him. So again, this is a word from God. And what does God say here? He has reigned, uh, speaking of, of the Lord, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. So this isn't even really about the child who's just been born, John the Baptist. But again, you think of John the Baptist and his whole existence and function and purpose. It's all about pointing to the one who's to come after him, the Messiah. And so that's what, what Zechariah has in mind here as he's filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesying. And he's saying, this is what God is doing. The Messiah is about to come. And again, it's this child of mine who's going to be that forerunner and sort of point him out and prepare the way. But that Messiah is, is about to come uh, and will bring about what? Salvation, right? We'll raise up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. And what does he say? as he said through his holy prophets long ago. Again, the idea is like, God said this. We, we looked at a couple passages in Isaiah where this was talked about, but it's sort of like all over the Old Testament, prophet after prophet sort of speaking of this. And that's what Zechariah is talking about here. It's sort of like, God has said this. He said it long ago. And again, God is true to his word. It's not like he says it and then changes his mind and it doesn't happen. No, if God says it, it's a done deal. It's guaranteed. He said it and now he is bringing it to pass. That's what Zechariah is saying there. So reading on, as he said, through his holy prophets of long ago, <coughs> salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, Again, speaking on behalf of the Lord here, serving as a prophet. Indeed, that is, that is true. That does come to pass, right? Saying, hey, this child will be a prophet. And of course, John the Baptist was a prophet, uh, right? So, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Again, that is fulfilled. That is indeed the role of John the Baptist here spoken of. Uh, and then, of course, fulfilled as we see. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So we have, again, thinking of, sort of John the Baptist, Zechariah, Elizabeth, John the Baptist. We have God saying it, here's what's going to happen. And then he's true to his word. He follows through on what he said. And we're going to see the same thing in regard to Mary, right? Here's what God said. And now we're going to see him following through, carrying it, to carrying it to fruition, bringing it to pass. So now we're in chapter two, verse one. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. <clears throat> and I just want to pause here. So again, we have it being fulfilled. Hey, Mary, you're going to conceive, even though you're a virgin, miraculously by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you'll give birth to, to the Son. No ordinary person, God the Son in the flesh. And now we see it being fulfilled, carried to, to, to its conclusion, being brought to fruition here. But even just sort of looking at, at little details here, again, thinking of 
God saying something and then bringing it to pass, even just the little detail of like, well, well, where's the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem, prophesied about in the Old Testament. And I just think of like, just how neat it is that like, of course, this is brought to pass, but like how God even did that, right? There's a census that takes place. And so, okay, well, now we got to go up to, to Bethlehem to go and, and be registered there. And then while they're there, that happens to be the time where it's like, well, now it's time to give birth. And so he's born. And of course, fulfilling that prophecy that this is where the Messiah would come from in Bethlehem in Judea. And again, God said it, he brought it to pass. <clears throat> so reading on verse eight, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And again, just thinking of this, this, uh, this theme that we see running throughout this, this passage, chapter one, the first part here of chapter two, that when God says something, he follows through on it. He is true to his word. He keeps his promises. We see it so clearly here, whether it's with Zechariah and, and, and what God says there through the angel Gabriel, your wife's gonna, gonna, even though she's beyond childbearing years, she's gonna become pregnant, uh, give birth to a son, John. And, and again, here's what his ministry is gonna be about, preparing the way and then bringing it to fruition. Same thing with Mary, Gabriel showing up. Here's what's gonna happen. Even though you're a virgin, yet miraculously, you will conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit, give birth to a son, this wondrous, uh, not ordinary type of son, but God, the son in the flesh, the Messiah who save his people from their sin. And again, it's brought to fruition. And we see this theme, certainly it's even explicitly stated and highlighted here, as I mentioned uh, in, in verse 37 of chapter one, where the angel Gabriel says, for no word from God will ever fail, right? If God says it, it's gonna come to pass. That's even highlighted here. It's not just sort of in the story and the narrative we see, which, which we do see it taking place, but even the angel makes a point of highlighting this saying, when God says something, he's not gonna fail to do it. If he says it, he's true to his word and he's going to bring it to pass. And of course he does. And we see this stated elsewhere in scripture too. If we turn uh, to Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, that's what's spoken of here, where it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Right, what's being said, there's sort of like, the way man operates is sometimes we say we're gonna do something, we make some sort of promise, but then we change our minds or we maybe we just lied about it and we, you know, what we said we were gonna do, well, we don't follow through on it. That's how man often operates. But what's being said here is God isn't like that. He doesn't operate the way uh, broken, sinful, fallen man operates. But when God says he's gonna do something, he does it. When he makes a promise, he'll make good on that promise and keep it unful and fulfill it. That's what's being said there. And we see it elsewhere. If we turn to Isaiah chapter uh, 55, <coughs> verses 10 and 11, this is uh, what we read. In fact, uh, Richard even made reference to this as he was leading us in worship. So Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Right? So here what he's, he's sort of using this, this parallel is, is he ultimately makes his point here in, in Isaiah, as Isaiah makes his point. What he's saying is sort of the way things operate with precipitation, rain and snow, uh, it's not like, oh, it comes down from heaven, but then it just sort of like evaporates off, makes its way to the ocean, evaporates off and goes back to heaven without accomplishing its intended purpose. No, it comes down, it accomplished its intended purpose, right? Why does God have it rain and snow and so forth? Well, to, to water the earth so that 
plants can grow, crops can flourish, and animals can eat the, the fruit of that and, and, and be sustained, right? There's a purpose. And so that, that precipitation, that, that water, it's not going to come down and then return back up without accomplishing its purpose. And he's saying, it's the same way with my word. This is what, what God's saying. So, reading on in verse 11, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it, right? It's like, it's not like I'm gonna say I do something, I'm gonna do something, make some sort of promise, and then my word just sort of returns to me without being fulfilled and, and doing what it said it was gonna do. No, if I say I'm gonna do something, guaranteed, it will be done. It, it, it will come to fruition. If I promise something, I will make good on it. My word isn't gonna return to me without having uh, been fulfilled. That's what's being said there. Again, very clearly, we see it all over Scripture, whether it's at the beginning of Luke here, whether it's in Numbers, in Isaiah, it's just all over the place, where this is just sort of who God is. This is his character. He is true to his word. If he says he's going to do something, he follows through on it. If he makes a promise, he's going to keep his promise. He keeps his word. And you could look at that and say, okay, you know, I, I understand that. Probably it's not like a new theological concept to you guys. Like, oh yeah, God keeps his word. I, I knew that. Thanks, Pastor Steve. Um, but there is great significance to it, and I think we can sort of overlook it and, and sort of take it for granted. I mean, just sort of think like, what if that weren't the case? What if God didn't keep his word? Think about every wonderful promise, everything God said he was going to do, everything he promised in Scripture. It's like we couldn't count on that. It, it would all be sort of up in the air, a question mark. Uh, every little thing, everything he said, everything he's promised— you know, you can think of, well, he said, you know, all who repent and believe in Christ Jesus will be forgiven and saved and have eternal life. But if he doesn't keep his word, well, then is he just going to, you know, just like men do, as Numbers was talking about, is he going to say, you know, I just, I changed my mind, you know, I'm going to go back on that. I just changed how I'm going to operate. And even though you have saving faith in, in Christ Jesus, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to uh, punish you for your sin regardless, nonetheless. You know, or you think of every other promise in Scripture. What's in store for us in eternity? Those of us who belong to the Lord. Yeah, I changed my mind. You're not going to have that glorious inheritance. I know I said it, but I don't keep my word. I'm not going to operate that way, and I've just changed my plan. Or, you know, every other promise that, that God loves us and cares for us and watches over us and protects us and provides for us. And if God just said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really true to my word. I've just changed my mind. I'm not going to follow through on that. Again, it's like, all of that is called into question if, if God's character is such that he doesn't keep his word. But of course, he does indeed keep his word 100% of the time. If he says it, he will be true to it. If he says he's going to do something, if he makes a promise, he's going to follow through on it. He's going to keep his promise, keep his word 100%. And so knowing that, right, well, then everything he has promised us, as we talked about, that if we turn to Christ in saving faith, well, we're forgiven, we're saved, we have eternal life. We know, well, that, that's sure, that's solid, secure. He's not going to, like, change his mind. We can count on that, right? We, we can sort of bank on that fact. He said it. It's guaranteed. It's done. He's not going to change his mind about that. And so we can rejoice in that and, and, and know it's sure and secure and find great comfort and, and peace in that. Or what's in store for us? Just the glory and eternity, the, the new creation, everything perfect, everything made right, dwelling in the fullness of God's presence and, uh, you know, all, all of that. Again, knowing, well, God's promised that, and he always keeps his promise. We can know that that's sure, it's secure. We know that that's what's in store for us. God isn't going to just change his mind and say, nope, not the case anymore, too bad. No, we know it's guaranteed. And so we can just rejoice in that and find great peace and comfort in that factor. Again, every other promise that he's made in Scripture, as I mentioned earlier, you know, to, to love us uh, and just watch over us and care for us, provide for us, protect us, right? It's not like he's going to change his mind on that. No, he said it. He's promised it. It's guaranteed. It's a done deal. We can bank on that fact. And as we think of the fact that this is just the character of God, it's who he is. He keeps his word. It's something that, that we ought to just be rejoicing and not taking for granted, saying, yeah, I know that and take it for granted, but really rejoicing in this fact that God is true to his word, that he follows through on what he said, that he keeps his promise. We ought to rejoice in it. We ought to thank him for it. And it should be a source of great comfort and peace to us that, that we know now all of those promises, all that he said in scripture, it's guaranteed, it's sure, it's secure. And, and that's really what I want for us as a takeaway, as an application, to know that, that this is what God's like. This is his character. He keeps his word. But then just to rejoice in it, give him thanks for it, and just find great comfort and peace in it. Amen. And let's pray. Lord God, this is, this is just who you are. 
your character. You are a God who is true to his word. You don't go back on things. You don't change your mind the way that we fallen sinful human beings often do. No, if you say something, we can take it to the bank. It's guaranteed. It's sure. It's 100% guaranteed. Or if you make a promise, you will keep it. You are true to your word 100% of the time. And we just thank you for that fact, that that's who you are, that that's your character. And we just rejoice in that and, and find great comfort and peace knowing that every wondrous, glorious promise, everything you've said, it's for sure. It's guaranteed. Uh, just thinking of what's in store for us in eternity. You've said it. We know it's going to come to pass. That we have saving faith in you, Lord Jesus, and that means we're forgiven, we're saved, we have eternal life. That, that you have said that and promised that, Lord God. It's guaranteed. You're not going to change your mind. May we rejoice in that. Every promise, Lord, we know it's sure. We know it's secure. We know it will not change. You will not go back on it. And may that be truly a source of great comfort and peace to us. May we rejoice in it and give you thanks with all that we are for the God that you are who follows through on his word. Amen.